Good morning. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings. We're so thankful for your gift of scripture and the blessing it has been to us. We pray for your presence now as we consider the book of Romans. In the name of Jesus, amen. Romans is a favorite gospel of many. It is also a favorite of mine. But many people misunderstand what the main theme of Romans is, and we're going to be talking about the main theme of Romans. What is the primary purpose of Paul in writing the book of Romans? And in doing so, we're going to be discussing Paul's gospel, because it is in Romans that Paul repeatedly uh, refers not just to Romans, but where he says, my gospel. Desmond Ford claims that the gospel uh, is found only in the book of Romans and that there it deals only with universal legal justification at the cross. Paul's primary theme in Romans, however, is not justification, nor is it strictly legal, but the transfer of everlasting promises, the covenant promises from the Jewish nation to the Christian church. And we will see this this morning, uh, beginning first of all, we will uh, consider the if we go to the last three verses in Romans, we find that Paul explains just what his gospel is all about. And now we read together from Romans 16, 27, uh, 25 to 27. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of of the mystery which has been kept in silence through all times eternal, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the eternal God, is made known unto all the nations and to obedience of faith. To the only wise God, through whom, uh, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. If you will notice that Paul calls his gospel, he says, my gospel, and he calls it the mystery kept secret since the world began and now is made manifest to all nations, which really means to all Gentiles, because the Jewish people thought of themselves as being a special people of God and the all the rest of the nations were called the nations, by which, which in usually is translated in the King James Version as Gentiles. And so Paul says, the, seek, the mystery kept secret since the world began and now made manifest to all Gentiles. Three years later, Paul explained what mystery means in Ephesians and Colossians, which we will uh, now examine. We look at uh, Colossians first, beginning with verse 19. For it was the pleasure of the Father that in him, that is in Christ, should all the fullness dwell, and through him to reconcile all things unto himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross, through him, I say, whether things upon the earth or things in the heavens. And you, being in time past alienated and enemies in your mind, in your evil works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and without blemish and unreprovable before him, if so be that you continue in the faith, 
grounded and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached in all creation under heaven, whereof I, Paul, was made a minister. You'll notice that Paul, in explaining his gospel, gives primary emphasis to the Gentiles. He's talking to the Gentiles, the nations, and he's, he's speaking of them as having been enemies. And now through Christ's death, they've been reconciled through his, through his death. But if they, the main thing is that they must continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That was their only hope, as we'll see in a moment. Which ye heard, which was preached in all creation, meaning all to the, all of the nations under heaven. And then he ends that, that uh, uh, chapter with, uh, whereof I, Paul, was uh, made a minister. I said it ends the chapter. I mean, it ends the verse is what I meant. With, uh, uh, I, Paul, have made a minister. And now we continue in verse 24. Uh, Paul says, Christ in you, the hope is the hope of glory. Verse 24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. For the sake of whom? For the sake of the Gentiles. Paul was made a prisoner uh, in Jerusalem because he had been, had been preaching to the Gentiles and the Jews wanted to get rid of him. So he says, now from, uh, from his uh, prison in, uh, in Rome, now he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and fill up on my part that which is lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. In other words, he is undergoing this uh, imprisonment for the sake of Christ's body, which he says is the church. Whereof I was made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which was given me to you word to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which had been hid for ages and generations, but now has it been manifest to his saints to whom God was pleased to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you'll notice that in all three of these passages, in uh, Romans 16 in, uh, uh, and uh, in uh, Colossians, I guess we've only done two so far, uh, the focus is on the mystery that has been hid uh, for many generations and is now made known, and it is the only hope that the Gentiles have of glory. <clears throat> I continue now by examining verse 28. Whom we proclaim, this means Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ, whereunto I labor also striving uh, to according to his working, which uh, worketh in me mightily. So Paul uh, has, and twice in Colossians, has repeated his statement about the uh, uh, about the mystery which he introduced at the end of Romans. And that mystery he states very specifically is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now what is the you that he's talking to? He mentioned you word. He is addressing the Gentiles and is stating that they were once alienated from God, separated from him, had no hope, and now their hope is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We'll turn now to Ephesians and notice uh, 
that he says about the same thing. He is also, again, speaking to the Gentiles and calls them strangers from the covenant of promise, but who are now part of Israel, beginning with verse 1 in chapter 2. Wherefore, remember that once ye, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, and that ye were at that time separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And now in Christ Jesus, ye that were once afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who made both one and broke down the middle wall of partition, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. This is speaking about the ceremonial system. Until Christ came, there was considerable alienation between the Jews and the rest of the nations. Why? Because instead of Israel uh, serving as God's uh, missionaries to the world, which he planned for them to be, they uh, had become involved in idolatry and God sent them into captivity. And when they came out of captivity, they decided they would never go back into idolatry. And so they were careful about that, but they were not missionaries. They were, they were proud. And, and because of pride, their pride separated from the nations. They figured that they were the only ones saved, that the nations were worthless. And uh, because of that, there was a great deal of separation, alienation. And Paul uh, continues, having abolished in the flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. And by the way, why, was, why were the commandments contained in ordinances uh, a source of enmity? Because they separated between the Israelites and the rest of the world. That he might create in himself of the two, that is Jews and Gentiles, one new man, which... We, is he referring to the church, so making peace, and might reconcile them both in one body and to God through the cross, having slain the enmity. And Paul repeatedly speaks of that body as being the body of Christ, the church. Uh, when God separated the Israelites from the rest of the world, he did so that he might ordain them as missionaries to the world. And he gave them a special ordin a specific ordinance to, uh, to distinguish them, and that was circumcision, which we read a minute ago at, uh, in verse 1. He gave them the ordinance of circumcision as a symbol of their own faithfulness to him. But that ordinance of circumcision caused them to feel that they were unique and instead of recognizing that their, their Redeemer Christ was unique and that they would be there to represent him, instead they began thinking of themselves as unique and uh, that circumcision actually became a means of separating them from, from uh, their missionary work, uh, actually. It is a substitute for giving the gospel to the world. As a result, there was alienation. Whenever a given people, a person or a group of people are proud, they treat others with contempt. Israel had treated the Gentiles with contempt. And even when they went to shop, if they went to shop at a Gentile shop, when they came home, they had to uh, uh, cleanse everything that they had bought to make sure it was pure. And uh, so they, their, whole, uh, their whole relationship to the Gentiles is one of, of pride, superiority, and contempt. 
Now, uh, let's see, I think we were uh, through reading this. Uh, let us now turn to uh, the next passage in Ephesians, continuing on with verse 19. He now speaks of them as fellow citizens of the household of God. Now, the Jews had shown contempt to the Gentiles and had been separated from them, but through Christ, he planned to bring about a uh, reconciliation so that the Jews and Gentiles would be fellow citizens of the household of God. And that household he calls the temple of the Holy Spirit. Let us notice verse 19. So then, you who uh, you are no more strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, being built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom each several building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple unto the Lord. This is a little bit awkward wording here. It says, in whom each several building, which by which he means that each person is an individual building or a body temple. But they fitly framed together, that is the various uh, members, fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. So we find that, and according to Paul and other portions of scripture, the uh, individual is a body temple because it is in the mind that we worship God. And also he intends for the whole church to be brought together in close union as a temple, as an enlarged temple. So it says, in whom ye also are builded together, that is the various temples, for a habitation of God in the spirit, which is reference uh, to his body, the church. So the Gentiles, he says, are fellow heirs. Heirs of what? Well, heirs of the promise to Abraham. The Jews called themselves the children of Abraham. Indeed, God had given uh, covenant, his covenant to Abraham and covenanted with Abraham that the, through his seed, through his children, all the world would be blessed. Now, Paul announces that the Gentiles are part of that covenant and fellow heirs. Verse 1 of chapter 3 in Ephesians, For this cause I, Paul, the, pri uh, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, in behalf of you Gentiles, notice again, he not only uh, mentions that uh, he's writing also from, from Rome, the, from the prison, and he not only uh, tells them that he's a prisoner, but as he did with the Colossians, he tells them why in be, he was a prisoner of Christ Jesus in behalf of you Gentiles. In other words, basically what he's saying is that the gospel that I preach has brought me to this place. And I have been imprisoned because of preaching the gospel in behalf of you Gentiles. If so be that ye have heard of the dispensation of that grace of God which was given to me to you word, how that by revelation was made known to me the mystery which whereby when you read, read, you can perceive my understanding in the mystery of Christ. Notice mystery, mystery. Colossians mentioned the mystery twice and so does Ephesians except in Ephesians, it's very close together. So, whereby when ye read, you can perceive my understanding in the mystery of Christ. In this case, the mystery of gospel is called the mystery of Christ because the gospel is the gospel of Christ, which in other generation was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed 
unto his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. To wit, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise, that is the promise given to Abraham, in Christ Jesus. Through what? Well, through, through the gospel. This is what Paul is preaching to them. He's telling them of the meaning of the gospel right now. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, which was given me according to the working of his power. Now, why does Paul speak of the gospel being my gospel? He does that elsewhere, but not here. But why would he call it my gospel? Because Paul was the one who preached the gospel to the Gentiles. While the other apostles were preaching to the Jews, Paul preached it to the Gentiles. In fact, when Paul was met on the Damascus Road by Christ, he told him there, he said, Paul, I, I, I have plans to send you far hence unto the Gentiles. And then he did send him, and, and uh, as a result, Paul was eventually imprisoned. Paul's gospel never focuses on legal justification. As I mentioned, Brother Des Ford claims that uh, Paul's gospel is uh, presented in only in fully only in, uh, in Romans. And there he says it was only a legal justification. And of course he would say that it was uh, effected at the cross, that we were all justified at the cross. The fact is there's nothing in Romans that suggests that. There's nothing in all of scripture that suggests that. Uh, what Paul is focused on in Romans is the development of the Jew-Gentile church. And his emphasis is that the gospel of Christ is the gospel to all the world, to all nations, all kindreds. And uh, the central thing is the purpose of that justification is that Christ may be in us the hope of glory. Christ in you, Gentiles, the hope of glory. Now, it was one thing for, for Christ to appear to Paul and be in Paul, but it's another thing for the Gentiles to realize that the same Christ who met Paul on the way to Damascus intends to meet them and to become a very part of their lives. So far from a strictly legal justification, right, at the very beginning of Paul's gospel, we find Christ in you. And the fact is that Paul speaks of Christ in you and you in Christ. Now we turn back to a verse that we read at the close of Romans. And uh, we'll notice uh, that Paul explains it. We've already read it, but we'll read it again. Now to him that is able to establish you according to my gospel, this is what Paul is speaking to at the conclusion of Romans, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept in silence through times eternal, but now is manifest and made known to all the nations not to all the Jews, but to all the nations, and to obedience of faith, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so Paul very clearly identifies his purpose in, in Romans as he concludes his message to them. The mystery, he says, kept secret since the world began, is, is now made manifest to all nations. And he is speaking to the Romans, and the, the Gentile Romans. We'll return now to Romans 1.1, 1, 1, the very first verse, and see how this uh, concept fits what we read here. 
Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And by the way, when he speaks of my gospel, he first speaks of it as the gospel of God. He will later speak of it as the gospel of Christ. And then he will also speak of it as just plain the gospel. So as far as Paul is concerned, the gospel of God is what he calls my gospel. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he promised afore through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, through whom we receive grace and apostleship, and to obedience of faith among all the nations, all the Gentiles, for his namesake, to all that are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here that Paul's introduction to the Romans is very similar to his conclusion. He identifies himself as a servant of Jesus Christ, an apostle, and that he is separated unto the gospel of God. In the last verse, he calls it my gospel, but he's already called it the gospel of God. Which, and by the way, he identifies it, identifies it as that which was presented through the ancient prophets, the Jewish prophets in the Holy Scripture concerning uh, his son, which would be Christ. Now, the interesting thing is that the gospel always focuses on Christ. Whether Paul calls it the gospel of God or my gospel, he's talking of the same thing. We don't have more than one gospel. In fact, Paul later in another place said that if, if uh, anyone preaches a different gospel than he has presented, let him be anathema, because there is no other gospel, just the gospel uh, that he presented, the gospel he presents in Romans, which centers on Christ as the Savior of the world, not just the Savior of the Jewish nation, but the Savior of the world. And Paul's purpose in Romans is to show that the, that the covenant of God with Abraham is now transformed, uh, for, uh, transferred to the whole Gentile world, which would include Jews, Jews as well as Gentiles. So Paul's gospel then is we find here is to the Greeks and the barbarians and also to the Romans. Verse 8, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit in the gospel of his Son. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I proposed to come to you and was hindered hitherto, that I might have some fruit in you also, even as in the rest of the Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. So I am ready to preach the gospel to you also that are in Rome. So the Romans uh, are a, a part of the Gentile world, just the same as the Greeks and the barbarians. And by the way, barbarians was the expression that the Jewish people used uh, for those who uh, had little education. And so the Greeks would be the intelligence, uh, intelligentsia of the world, and barbarians would be those who had little education. And again, Paul speaks of my gospel, the gospel of God, the gospel of his Son, and identifies it as the power of God and his salvation. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith, as it is written, 
the just, uh, the righteous shall live by faith. And by the way, I was about to say the just because the same word in, in Greek is translated either just or righteous. The just shall live by faith or the righteous shall live by faith. You please notice that that has to do with a subjective experience. It's not simply a legal th document in heaven as Desmond Ford uh, would have it. The fact is that we are, we are, uh, uh, we are not only saved by faith, not only be righteous by faith, but it says in verse 17, therein is revealed a righteousness of God from faith to faith, which means a, a growing faith. And the more, the more we uh, grow, the, the more we will, uh, the greater faith we will have. And I pause here a moment to notice I've inserted the word subjective experience. Uh, unfortunately, many people, including Des Ford, believe that the uh, justification took place at the cross 2,000 years ago and was a st strictly objective or legal thing which God recorded justified for every man. But he here it shows the faith by which we are justified is to grow from faith to faith. faith. And it, 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 then it says, as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. So this is talking about a present experience that grows subjectively. That is, by subject, I mean the person himself, not just something that is written about him in heaven. Paul begins his gospel uh, in Romans by explaining the Gentile needs. We've already read all the verses from verses 1 to 17. And now we read verse 18 that begins a treatment of the need of the Gentiles. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hinder the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God manifested it unto them. Now the them we're talking about, we'll see, is the Gentile world. For the invisible things of him, of God, since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being perceived through those things which are made, even his everlasting power and divinity, that they, that the Gentiles, might be without excuse. Because that knowing God, they glorified him not as God, neither gave thanks, but became vain in their reasoning, and their senseless heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God for the likeness of an image of corruptible man and of bees, of birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. This, of course, is talking about heathen idolatry. It also, it's important to notice that nature itself so testifies of God that the Gentiles who do not have Scripture are without excuse. There is enough evidence in Scripture itself so that the Gentiles are responsible. Of their need is for an entire life mind trans, uh, transformation and a lifestyle uh, reformation so that they can live in pure lives. Then verse 24, Wherefore God gave them up to in the lusts of their hearts unto uncleanness, that their bodies should be dishonored among themselves. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women changed the natural use into that which is against nature. 
and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lusts one to another, men with men, working unseemliness, and receiving in themselves the re that recompense of their error which was due. So it is not necessary for me to comment much on this because it's evident that this is talking about uh, the issue that we find such a hot issue today. God himself has, through the Apostle Paul, has declared his thinking and feeling when men link up with men and women with women instead of, of following the plan of the Creator who made the two one, uh, male and female. This is God's own plan. Paul continues and says, even as they refused to have God in their knowledge, God gave them up to a reprobate mind. And by the way, it's our mind that determines uh, the, the uh, uh, meaning of what we do in our bodies. To do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, hateful to God, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that they that do practice such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but also applaud those, uh, Green's uh, translation says, applaud those that practice them. They also do the same thing, but all, they not only do the same thing, but consent to them that practice them. And so we find the first chapter of Romans ends with an indictment, a strong indictment of the Gentile world, which with its wickedness and uh, uh, declares that they are worthy of the judgment of God. But as we turn to the next chapter, chapter two, we find that Paul uh, will be uh, dealing with the Jews face to face and declaring that they must face the judgment, for they too need the same gospel. It is a very great interest to notice that four times in chapter one, uh, which deals with the Gentiles, Paul uh, speaks of his gospel. In chapter two, uh, dealing with the Jewish people, he speaks of the gospel four times, and in each, gospel, each chapter, he indicts them both and claims that they are facing the judgment. On our next lecture, we will deal with the issue of what advantage then did Jews have over the Gentiles? And Paul says they did have an advantage. That advantage was scripture. But scripture itself became a liability to them when they did not obey its principles. Shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We pray for your presence in our lives, not just in our minds, but in our very lives. In the name of Jesus, amen.